had an example of an estate, and if we had an example of three children, if there were no gifts given to philanthropy under the assumptions that we had, which is about a two and a half million dollar estate given by real estate, some investment assets, etc., uh, that each child would receive approximately six hundred eighty-one thousand dollars. And depending on how you gave in the philanthropy, whether you gave a cash gift or donation of a share gift, as you can see. By giving 10% of the estate value in this example, $250,000, the children, each child reduces the, the estate by only about $30,000, $25,000. So it was a very minor impact to the ultimate estate beneficiaries by giving $250,000 to philanthropy in this situation. So therefore, this is a very legitimate, effective estate planning tool where you can fulfill your philanthropic objectives through an estate and offer significant tax benefits which really have a very modest impact to the beneficiaries. And uh, this is all being done because the government actually has an income tax act all of these abilities for you to do so. So this was the key issue of a discussion. Then when we start talking, I am having, again, so, so therefore what we wanted to discuss was how do we, the balance of the presentation will be based on how do we move the strategy? So we don't have much time. So what we wanted to do was just talk about what we're going to have in a panel discussion is to talk about some of the common barriers to execution. Everybody in this room has been to presentations, has had discussions with advisors about having wills done, the use of philanthropy, the use of other estate planning issues. But it's amazing how we still have a lot of our clients that come in and we ask questions. Do you have a will? Yeah, I do, but I haven't looked at it in 10 or 15 years. And there's been so many life transitions between that time. We often sit there and say, so we came up with, why is it not being happy? Is it time? Is it cost? Is it inability to make certain decisions? These are the common barriers that the panel discussion will then go through some questions and help you identify some of the, like we say, relatively simple tools that can be exercised in order to get you from strategy to execution and get it done. So thank you. Thank you, Richard, for uh, that The uh, first question that I'd like to put to both of you, gentlemen, is uh, what would you say are the three things that are hold people back from preparing their estate? You want me to start? Okay. Well, I, I can start. I'm still a little concerned about this one. I'm wondering if we should be doing a golf shot so that we can hear it as it comes off the turf or <laughs> leave it for now. Um, Today's family is incredibly complex. And people, I find in my practice, people get overwhelmed with all of the things that you have to think about uh, to do your estate plan. They hear estate plan, they go, oh, I'm not an estate plan. Because they're thinking, how do I take care of my children from my first marriage? How do I take care of my wife from my third marriage? How do I deal with a, a child that's handicapped? How do I deal with the succession planning issues that are happening in my business? Um, and the problem is they think of these things all together at the same time and you can't focus that way. You can't get anything accomplished that way. So the first barrier is the complexity of people's lives today. And uh, one of the tools for getting around that is to just start, is to just commence the process, see your advisor, see your accountant, see your financial planner, see your lawyer, say, here, you take care of it, and they'll take you through it simply. So. Okay, I'm gonna supplement that issue, uh, and not are there just complicated issues people need to deal with. I find oftentimes it's the simplest of issues that stop people from executing their estate. Um, and these are all discussions, like Tim says, it gets all muddled up into one big problem rather than, than dissecting it into small problems. And some of the discussions we have with our clients today are, uh, my state does have certain amounts of, of complexity. Who do I put as my executor? Who's going to make the decisions on behalf? That oftentimes gets stopped, the whole decision. And we're having some very interesting philosophical conversations. As a financial advisor, I'm not a philosophy major, but it's interesting how we have to be now, is that uh, we have very successful clients. And they're asking two things. Either one, how much will I be leaving my children? And two, do I want to leave that much to my children, or how do I do that? 
Um, and there's some very good examples of large estates being passed on to uh, children at the improper times, which creates uh, some, some issues. So we're finding that, again, as Tim is saying, is the biggest barrier is the unknown. And frankly, uh, an estate of any complexity, it's really a three-way situation. You actually have three agendas and sometimes competing agendas in getting a state done. One, you have the what I call the social aspects. What are my family philosophies? What do I want to do? How do I get there? The second one is the financial aspects. I'm being told that I'm going to be leaving a significant amount. Uh, what's the best way of arbitraging the Income Tax Act? I'm hearing things like dual wills from people. I'm hearing things like testamentary trusts. I'm hearing things like alter ego trusts. I'm hearing all of these complex discussions from various people, which is the best for me. And the last one is the legal issues. How do I execute on that legally to do that? But as Tim says, the process is simplified by starting with one of your advisors, whether it's financial, legal, accounting, tax, starting with the person of choice, and then start having that person move the agenda to execution. And that actually works extremely well when the involvement is there. I might just add one more. Um, as we were discussing this, and we were saying that everybody wants to be perfect. They want to do the perfect job the first time. And you really don't have to be perfect the first time when you're doing your will. Put your will in writing. You can change it any time that you want. And you'll find that as soon as you put it down the first time, it makes it easier then to tweak it. So just start. Just do it. Um, get out. Some people are sitting around saying, well, I have to pick a guardian for my children. Okay. But they don't know that you're only picking a guardian for 90 days. This is something your advisor can tell you. You have all of these things going on in your head. And there may be some answers and solutions out there waiting for you. So... By all means, uh, check with your advisor. Thank you. Uh, now, a lot of what you're just discussing uh, has to do with people with estates and complicated affairs. Mm -hmm. What about the person that comes to you who says, I don't have much property. Do I really need uh, all the financial planning uh, involved with the will? Financial okay, planning. financial planning, that's my elevator, right? Yes. Um, my personal bias by training is everybody should have a financial plan, and I don't want to start using old terms like, you know, you don't plan to fail, you just fail to plan. But there is truth to that. <laughs> However, um, I will share a story that just came on my desk from one of my junior associates about uh, three weeks ago. Uh, it's a very sad story. Uh, this was not a complicated estate, but it's a very, very sad story that was in the papers uh, two years ago. So what transpired, if you recall, in uh, the west end of the city is uh, a husband killed his wife, and then subsequently killed himself, leaving behind two children. Not a very complicated estate. They had a house, some in savings, some RSPs, um, some insurance, uh, etc. <coughs> they left, and how, sorry, and how we got involved was the employer wanted to raise some funds to go into an educational account on behalf of the uh, surviving children. So we started the file by opening up the accounts to be funded by the employer contributions and it was going to be an RESP account in order to maximize the grants. Uh, we could not do it. We could not do it. We could not open the accounts because there was no will and there was no guardianship. Uh, so without that we suggested that we get, we had to get a court because again there was no will. The person who wanted to do this wanted to go to the courts and get the guardianship and get the process going. That was approximately two years ago. The will was contested by various sources. Um, two years have passed. It's a relatively small estate. I was just speaking with uh, the individual who would like to have a discussion with anybody who wants to hear it. She's quite well known in Ottawa. Um, has said that with a relatively small estate, there's already $60,000 in legal fees that have been spent over the last two years and more to go. Uh, also, we have some emotional issues. At 18, the children are 17 and 60. At 18, the house belongs to them. So she's going, how do I tell the kids how to look after a house? Because I have no involvement once they're 18. All the monies that they're going to receive goes to them at 18. I ask anybody here who has an 18-year-old, are they prepared to receive any large sums of money, free and clear, with no direction, no moral suasion? So the challenge is, 
by not having a simple document and going back to, does it cost a lot of money to do a will? My answer is no. Um, it's not a lot of money for a simple will. Yes, the cost can be a little higher on a more complicated will, but when you talk about the savings of opportunity, the savings of emotion, the savings of saving kids' lives, I just don't know what else to say. So that's a very, very simple estate with some very bad tax, very bad financial consequences and likely life consequences to the beneficiaries. Yeah. When you look at your will, just naming an executor in your will, what you're doing is you're appointing somebody that has the legal authority to deal with the property of the deceased. Without an executor, without a will, there is nobody that is legally entitled to deal with that property, no matter how small, no matter how big. And that's when you do get into costs. I have a not as tragic an example, but uh, a single mother, uh, a spouse dies, uh, the bank calls me and says, the spouse is here with her lawyer and they would like you to release the $28,000 in the bank account, which is all that this fellow had to his name. And I had to advise them that you can't do that because you have to go to court, you have to have an administrator for the estate appointed, it's going to cost about $2,500 to do that, and they had to go through that process simply because they didn't do a simple will that named an executor that could take care of the property. So. To be easy on your family in very trying times, it's uh, good just to put it down in writing. Thank you. Now, there was a mention of uh, being able to go back and revisit the working plans. Uh, can you describe a situation in your professional experience where a will was literally done in like, the last days, the waiting days of someone's life? And uh, how long? That would, would be a situation where, unfortunately, they wouldn't be able to revisit it in okay. I'll start this because I guess I'm the storyteller. Uh, uh, so in our in our office, we we take uh, IP stands for integrated planning. We do a lot of holistic planning, and a lot of times the clients come to us because we're managing their financial affairs. And uh, oftentimes, not oftentimes, every time the will comes into discussion, I should have it reviewed. As Tim in his opening comments had, you know, second marriage inheritances, some complications in the estate. Um, not overly complicated, we started the process, but like everything else, guess what gets in the way of will planning? Life. Holidays. So, in the middle of the process, they said, look, we'll, we'll re-engage, no big deal, because we have a real simple will, but we know it's not correct. But we'll, we'll just deal with this um, when we return from holiday, from a golf holiday down in the States uh, in about three weeks. Uh, fast forward about a week, I'm shopping, and Saturday with my wife, I get a phone call from my client saying, you got to go to the Ottawa General, sorry, the Civic Hospital right away. I'm sitting there going, oh, I thought you were in Florida. No, uh, the spouse was flown back air ambulance with potential, with pancreatic cancer, with only diagnosed at that time, only moments, days, weeks to live. So I immediately had to go in. Uh, and talk to the client and review all our notes and confirm a few things. And I then called Tim on a Saturday <laughs> to go down to execute a will. And now I'll pass the story on to Tim as to how quickly the will was executed. It's amazing how a life-changing event like that can focus one's mind to get a will done. And uh, we went down and we took the notes. Uh, Virtually immediately went back to the office and drafted up a will and uh, I brought my wife uh, down to the hospital bed and we uh, signed up the will. I think it was the day, the day. that day or... Yeah, exactly. You know, and, uh, and the whole room was quarantined. And, and <laughs> we couldn't get our notes out. They weren't going to let me take the notes that I had written down all of the will instructions on. So we had to do a little bargaining there. But uh, yeah, it can, it can happen any time. You know, it, uh, what's, uh, what's the saying? Uh, Tempus fugit, memento mori, uh, you know, time flies, remember death. It, it's going to come for us, and uh, you should be prepared. I, I, if I can just add on to this, and I want to go back to what Tim was saying is, in the will planning process, there's a lot of moving parts that will change over time. And this is not an exercise of perfection, but an exercise of effectiveness. And this situation, this approach, does not need to be overly complex. And while your situations are all unique, they do follow certain patterns. We all are human beings that have similar patterns. 
And your advisors have experience and have been doing this. I know a lot of good financial advisor, accounting, law, legal practitioners in Ottawa that have fantastic experience to start the process and get it going with simple questions that become logical sequences to get the process done. So I, where I want to go with this, and what our biggest fear of this discussion was to create such a large, this is such a complicated issue that you're going to spend thousands of hours and tens of thousands of dollars in executing a will. That is not the case. It can be done very simply. Yes, there are cases where there is complexity and cost, but the tax savings and the, in, the issues and the opportunity costs are so significant that it pales in comparison to the opportunity costs. But just, I think Nike had it, I'm not supposed to use the trade work, I'm sorry. You know, just do it is truly the whole thing. I, I remember working with Joe Strauss at JDS. This, what the, the, the joke was at the firm was, JDS stood for, just do something. That's what it stood for. That was his, that was his going line. So just do something, please. <laughs> Thank you. I, we, uh, we're coming short on time, so I'm going to just go to the last question that I had in mind, which is uh, donors are not clear uh, often about the fact that the OJCF is a vehicle to give not only to the Jewish community, but to any charitable causes. Why should they start or build uh, their foundation through OJCF? You want to start there or let me start? Uh, I can say just because um, there are so many different organizations that can benefit doing it through the foundation and go back to complexity. Well, I don't know if I want to give to this one or to that one or to this one. Uh, you can do it all through the one foundation and they have the advisors there that are going to be able to help you uh, meet your goals. Uh, so it's, it's a terrific uh, one-stop shopping organization. If I can add to that, um, uh, as Tim said, one of, the, one of the barriers to philanthropy is A, who do I give to? Will a charity be alive? How do I spell the charity's name? It's one of your favorite ones. Um, and what's, what's very advantageous of the, uh, the foundation here is, first of all, one of the barriers to cost is the legacy challenge. So some of the costs have been mitigated through the legacy challenge. It's a very useful issue. But what truly impressed me uh, is, as I mentioned in my earlier commentary, is, is that not only is there a legal and a financial aspect to a will, but there's also a social aspect to the will. What is my philosophy? Who do I want to leave my, my hard-earned assets to? And how do I make that as a meaningful contribution, both short-term and long-term, to, to the community? And where the foundation is very useful is not only are they a resident